Welcome to DivCasts from University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. First of all, please do sign in. We have an analog sign-in sheet today. Um, but um, if, if you're interested in craft teaching credit, then we do need your student number on that piece of paper, so please do put it there. Breakfast, lunch will be at noon. Um, please do feel free to come and go during the day, and, um, and we're, we're thrilled that you're here. Upcoming craft teaching events, um, we have one on Monday. It's coming Monday at noon um, with Joe Glosser, an alum of this divinity school, um, on the pedagogy of service learning which should be of substantial interest, and that's an arts of teaching event, so people who need arts of teaching credit um, would be advised to, to join us. Check out our schedule for more events, and we look forward to seeing you there. I'll hand things over to Lucy Pick to introduce the day and get us started. Thank you so much, Aaron, and thank you as, you know, as, as a practice teaching coordinator for all you we know, all get there. A round of thanks for helping to organize this. I want to also thank um, the Marty Center and Mark Gilpin, who, without whom we would not have any food to eat, and Julia, uh, Julia, 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, without whom even more we would not have to have any food to eat. Uh, I'm also uh, I'm really glad to see such a proud faculty and as well as students here. Um, I think this is going to be really fun. So, an introduction to religious studies is a staple of the college curriculum, and probably people in this room will go off and teach it at some point. At many places, it's a general education course. Um, it also attracts and introduces students to the religious studies major. Those are what we might call some of its institutional virtues. Perhaps a little bit more thoughtfully, an introduction to religious studies introduces students to a way of talking about religion that they've likely not experienced before and which should stand them in good stead as they become fully adult members of this pluralistic and complicated world. College students all come in with some idea of or relationship to religion although almost none of them have an idea of what the academic study of religion entails, what it is that we stand on that And that's what the inter class does. It takes them where they are and moves them to another place, as, as, as every other class does. There's probably um, relatively broad agreement about the reasons for introducing the academic study of religion out there in the land. There is far less agreement about how to introduce the subject of religion. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So you may be familiar with the World Religions uh, Survey class. If it's fourth week, it must be Buddhism. Um, there's the theories and methods approach, studying the people who have studied religion. The craft of teaching program this uh, year has brought has brought two very different approaches um, to introduce to us through the textbooks of Professor Pueblo and Professor Natasha. Uh, who have their own ways of introducing religion. So how does the Divinity School at the University of Chicago think we should introduce religion? We're going to approach that question from a very different direction than all of the approaches that I've just mentioned today. I think we can think about what we're doing in this room today as a kind of an experiment, sort of a laboratory that I hope everyone around the table will participate in. I think we have broad provisional agreement about two things as we begin this experiment, both of which will be tested by it. The first is that introducing religion is about teaching students to have different kinds of conversations about religion than they're accustomed to have. The words and how they're used and what meanings are given to them in these conversations is important. I'm going to read to you the, the new description we have in the introduction of the studies class, which Professor Rosemary will be teaching next year. Um, I didn't want to put it out of I'm going to read it because I like it. <laughs> what are we talking about when we talk about religion? There are a multitude of answers to that question, and this course provides students with an entryway into a long standing conversation 
involving insiders, outsiders, and those in between. Around the meanings of a word that indexes ideas of God and the gods, of origins and ends, and of the proper places of humans and everything else, including animals, above, in, and below the world. Talk about religion today is, in fact, cheap. This course will aim to promote a grammatical currency, a morphology, vocabulary, syntax, to enhance the value of such talk. The second thing uh, I think that we have provisional agreement on is that this conversation to, should take as its starting point the sources construed broadly. With this in mind, each of the faculty members who will talk today has chosen a source that they might use in an introduction to religious studies class. Um, the packet, as you all know, is available on the web. If you have a schedule, if you don't have it in front of you and you have your computer here, there's a, a link on the schedule to be able to find it. So each, um, each speaker is going to spend a, a short period of time, 10 to 20 minutes or so, talking about the source they chose, about its perils and opportunities, and then discussion will be opened up to the whole group. Um, I think that this discussion will be especially, please come and get more seats up there. Um, I think that this conversation could be especially interesting for graduate students as you prepare to think about how to produce uh, a syllabus. Um, because it, you'll be able to see some of the things that were mystified in things like syllabus workshops. How do professors choose the sources they use in the classroom? What kinds of things do we need to think about? What kinds of gaps will we find, and how will we have to talk about them? Um, so as we talk, you know, feel free to get up. There's coffee and and, and um, pastries and things over there. In a way, We'll keep this a fairly casual and, and relaxed um, group. And uh, without further ado, I will call upon Mitchell to talk about the Avengers inscription. Thanks, Lucy, and, and thanks for that really, really helpful focusing introduction uh, to the day. Um, I'm, I'm going to disobey your instructions a little. <laughs> uh, to start, um, if I may, I, I hope this will work. Uh, about four of you in the room have um, seen me use the source that I'm discussing uh, today to introduce a course on ancient Christianity. And I, I, I draw upon this particular 22-line hexametric Greek inscription that according to some is the earliest datable Christian inscription. Um, to introduce and complicate what is ancient Christianism. And how do we know it when we see it? Um, uh, is this, in fact, even a Christian inscription? And so I draw upon it in that class as an introductory uh, um, moment, um, inductively to try to get at the question of what are the expectations of what ancient Christians might have looked like if we can see them on the historical record of, uh, of the ancient Mediterranean in both material culture and text. What I'm going to try to do today is use the same artifact, textual artifact, combined text and image artifact, in order to try to introduce what is religion. And so we'll see if it works and how it works. So you have been given in advance um, uh, three uh, exhibits, if you will. Uh, two are images. And one is a bilingual side-by-side -side text of the Greek inscription and my translation of it. And what I'd like to do is begin with a little bit of reenactment or, or enactment of how I would teach with this, and I want you to be the class. So and I, I have high expectations for you. Um, <laughs> uh, and then at a certain point, I'm going to pull up from that, and then I'm going to talk about um, the what I hope is going on um, in terms of our analysis of this. Um, and then I want to step back uh, time allowing and say a few words both about uh, why I think this can work and also um, some of my own even concerns about how and if and uh, it, it can work. So that, that that's my, my thinking. Um, so we we'll see if that's uh, at least near to uh, the end. But I don't want to do I don't want to do just 20 minutes of talk and then uh, group uh, in. So I really want to begin, uh, so now this is the class. So introduction to religion, it's the first day. I've learned all your names. Um, and I have a really simple question. 
And that is, what do you see? What do you see right now before your eyes? Or if you have it uh, in uh, a hard copy um, on the handout, what do you see? A rock with writing on it. A rock with writing on it. Good. Um, somebody put that rock on a pedestal? Somebody put that rock on a pedestal, exactly. And we'll see in a, in a minute, there's actually more than one pedestal uh, down below. There's no way of telling how big it is. There's no legend, or, there's no ruler. That's correct. And it's a piece of something. It's not the whole thing. It's been broken. It's been broken. It's broken on which sides, Allison? All four sides. All four? Well, well right, the right side of the bottom. Yeah, the left ladder will maybe intact, um, but not on uh, the top or the right or the bottom. Good. Looks like it's been restored, doesn't it? Yes, you can see, in, for some reason this doesn't shine up here. You can see that there's a break and there's plaster in the middle. I don't know if you can see from the varying colors of the white, cream, or ivory, um, but it's been restored. I don't know why it's shaking either. Um, it's, it's kind of doing the twist uh, up there. Um, Thanks for the PowerPoint, but that's restoration uh, in there. Other observations? It's written not in English, in Greek. Correct. It's in Greek, and it's all in uncial or capital letters in Greek. It's so big for, for, for what I think it is its purpose. I mean, why wouldn't you need like four or five inches for the map? It's so thick. Yeah, thick. It's Deep. so thick. I love that. Yeah. Yes, it is so thick. Now I'm gonna gonna bring come bring us in a little closer, um, and ask you if this changes what you see. There's no separation between words. Correct. It's inscriptio continua. The they're all going in the same direction. That's not booster. Yes, they're all going the same direction, Marshall. Uh, it was planned out. You can see that there was carved in first uh, a place to write. Yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a text box. You see that? Um, so that th there's a box within which this text has been set. You see the raised, uh, the, the raised surface. Um, anyone close enough to read what the first word is in Greek? Uh, es Rome? It's es, good, oh, es <laughs> Rome. So this is Rome. Now go to your text. To Rome appear in the text. Mm. Line seven. In line seven. So we're toggling back and forth a little. I hadn't planned to do that, but there's a curiosity here because the text box vi visually tells you it begins here, but the text I put before your eyes it doesn't begin there. It, there are six lines um, before. It. Looking at the bottom when it was the bigger picture, it looked almost like there maybe wasn't a text box on the bottom half below the restoration, but I couldn't quite tell. Exactly. You can't tell. It breaks off um, uh, below that point. So possibly the text box was added later instead of initially added. Um, certainly possible. I'm not sure by epigraphic habits that that is the, the case, um, but, but certainly possible. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of other things. This one, I, I don't have a good modern picture, so this is from an early uh, photo. Um, what do you see? This is the left lateral of the same, of what you've just been looking at. It's the le left lateral face. It looks like a wreath. It looks like a wreath. And it is a wreath. What else? Well, there's another box. There's another articulated box. In this case, it's encompassing this wreath. Um, question of what this uh, wreath uh, might uh, possibly mean. Now I'm going to come out of this uh, older picture into yet another picture to ask you what do you see. Um, this is a very complex visual field, but what do you see? I see a museum. Good. You're in a museum. You are. You're in, you're in the, the, the Vatican Museum in the Sio Cristiano Gallery for Ancient Christian Art, or uh, Ancient Christianity. Is that a reconstruction? Yeah, good. So we have, I promised Bill I wouldn't kill myself. Um, so this to the left is a reconstruction. 
Um, if you compare it with the image I gave you in, in advance, you can see that there's a head-on picture of this new construction is figure two in your packet. Um, now, what else do you see when you see these side by side? How does the reconstruction seem to line up with the lumps of marble? The leaf is in a different place. Sorry? <clears throat> the wreath has been relocated to the opposite side, or if there was one on both sides. Good. So they, they've actually, in this case, I, I've actually seen the other side. Huh? And <laughs> they think there, that, that there was a matching wreath on the right, but good inference, Emily, that they, they have reconstructed that. There, you can see there's, there's no evidence on the actual stones of what uh, ornament there might have been on the right lateral face. Other things of how the reconstruction seems to line up. There's a right hand right. Pardon? They're privileging the writing. They set it up to tell you that the writing is the most important thing. Yes, very much so, I think. Um, very, very much so. Because the writing is only on the first face, right? So I'm going to just go to show you this. That the writing is only facing you, the viewer. Um, and in fact, I can tell you that the earliest archaeologists who worked with the Aberkius, uh, uh lumps of stone, um, and in fact, some of those who even designed this for the Vatican assumed that the writing was on two or more faces of the stone monument. And yet the reconstruction is basically a billboard for the text. Um, and you can, and in fact, this is not impossible to do this, uh, I and mean, I can show you other examples, but it's a rather unusual disposition of the text on both the top and on the bottom. Um, and then they've also, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little bit of a, uh, of a lighter sheen to this in order to aid your eye to see the text content of the lumps of marble that are at its side. Any other things that you see? Uh, Karen? Yes, the lower part of the inscription in the original, it's uh, in the original. It's yeah. coming to the front. Yeah. And this one, in the, I think you see better in the fragment, that the lower part of the inscription seems to, oh, it's not even. Yeah. And so, this Yes, it turns forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that could be restoration. But this only, but this does, uh, this uh, does only only extends uh, some twelve lines. That it's not complete on the bottom. Um, other things about the, about this guy. Well, the other thing that's fishy about the, the restoration is they yeah. made this great big altar, for which there's absolutely no evidence. <laughs> they, yeah, it's very. I mean, somebody said it's very thick. Well, they made it a heck of a lot thicker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, precisely. And, and we have to talk about what this thing is. And one of the, the ways in which, because of course these lumps could, the, these lumps don't show you an awful lot, except it's a piece of monumental art. I mean, you know, it's got a text box and it has text inside. This is an elite object um, on which people have dedicated a good amount of care. Um, but it could have a variety of genre. Um, however, um, as we'll see in a minute, um, both because of the content of the text and because of a late antique um, uh, life of Aberkius, a narrative text that quotes the inscription in the final chapter, calls it a bomos. And bomos is a Greek word that means altar. And among other things, it's the word, or one of the words in the Septuagint, the Bible of Greek-speaking Christian uh, Christ believers, it's one of the words used for those pagan altars uh, of the idolatrous cult. So one of the issues is, what does a fourth century biographer do with the fact that he's got a funerary monument for somebody he thinks is a saintly bishop, and it's called an altar? And as such, then, what, you know, what does a homos look like? What might an altar look like? <coughs> One more feature of what do you see. If you look right here, someone made the really nice point that it's mounted. And you can see it's mounted twice. This is actually, this pivots, um, this rotates. This is on a, 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 a spit, if you will. But do you see the word fragmentum down below? You see a little bit of the Latin. Um, below it is a Latin inscription. Um, and this is an inscription that reads as follows. A fragment of a funerary inscription that came from Asia 
in which Abercius, second century bishop of Heropolis, attests to the consensus of the universal church in Shu, <laughs> in one faith. Darn. My new computer just... Aaron, you are you going to show me uh, it, what's wrong with... It took weeks to figure it out. We, we did it really? Okay, yeah. so... I, I, no. I'll come back, please. Okay, so where were we? Um, we were at Universae Ecclesiae Consensum in Una Fidem Testator. So this inscription, as mounted in the Vatican Museum, is, uh, is sitting on top of a legend that says it is a second century inscription that attests to the unit, the, the consensus of the universal church in a single faith. That's rather a dominating interpretive uh, uh, caption. Um, what it also shows is that one half of it was given by Abdul Hamid, the, uh, the here called the Emperor of the Turks, um, who gave it to uh, Leo the Thirteenth, Pontifex Maximus, in 1892. Therein lies an interesting historical tale that maybe we'll have a little bit of time for. But anyway, this is what you see. Now what I want to know, if this thing will move, which it will not. Now I want to know what you read. So if you would turn to your text. Um, let's start in line seven, because our original marble fragment does. What do you see? Is this a religious text? Is there anything religious in it? What do you? I'll tell your hand. Mm -hmm. It's got Paul in it. Well, it's got someone named Paul in it. It's got a version who's holy. It has a holy virgin. There you go. Comment. <laughs> Looks like there's a translation decision about good wine or Christ wine. Yes. Oinos Christos, um, which in the Edicism pronunciation of the second century could be Oinos Christos. And this is an old pun, or, well, this may or may not be an old pun that goes back to the letter to Philemon written by someone named Paulos who says, he who once was useless is now useful, both to you to him, to, to you and to me. You, Christos, um, a play on, Christos is just an ordinary Greek adjective that means useful, um, uh, you, Christos. So is it or is it not a pun? Um, and I, as translator, decided to give you both options at that point. Um, but most translators don't, because translators seek to replicate some interpretation of that text. The, um, the, the German version here uh, differentiates between upper and lower case, which we don't have in our object. Yes, correct. So at, at yeah, just he basically it, seems to make the decision that it's um, Christ. -like. Right, and as Wendy noted, on the stone itself, they're all uncial letters. So there's no differentiation of proper names by capital letters. But um, uh, so what Aaron is pointing to is that in verse 12, the word faith, pistis, is capitalized with the pi. I did not, I chose not to translate it or to capitalize it in my translation, but other translations do, in which case they're hypostasizing that this faith is something bigger than uh, the, the, the noun, and also with Lucy's, um, uh, uh, well, the, no, the virgin is not capitalized by Merkelbach, Me but the fish is capitalized, as is the fountain in mm -hmm. line 13. And the power of the capitalization is uh, obviously um, uh, significant. Is it religious? Well, it ends with money. <laughs> Just 
It's about funerary practices. It's about funerary practices. It's about funerary practices. That, yeah. in fact, one can uh, create a tomb before one's death. Yes. Uh, and that there's recycling of such tombs. Yes. Um, and that's somehow legally contested in some way. Right. right. Exactly. And the dead person is addressed to us. Yes. Mm-hmm. With requests for a prayer. Right? Yes. And Verse 19. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who from whom does he request <coughs> prayer? Whoever understands Greek and reads it. <laughs> well, whatever these things are. Yeah, these whatever things. these things are. are. <laughs> so is this about um, public viewing mm-hmm. or is this about initiate? viewing, um, and does that affect its status as religious or non-religious? What the these things refers to, maybe. One who understands these things, that could be esoteric. Precisely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, do we understand that as a verbal elbow to the ribs, that some of us get these, you know, in other words, is these things the real meaning of Paul, faith, the fish, the fountain, the Holy Virgin, the mysterious um, uh, poeme hagnosa, the, the um, uh, Holy Shepherd up there in verse 3, etc. The Queen. There's a lot of women on this, actually. There are a lot of women on this. And are these real women, or are they, are, is this the, 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 the Roman Empress, uh, Faustina, who's being referred to, or is there some other queen? The city herself? The city of Roma herself, who's a goddess, who's also worshipped in the east as a goddess. Um, her uh, her statuary is, is present. Um, who is that people? Um, <coughs> but what about religion again? Sure, the only religious claim is that uh, he is a disciple of our shepherd. Uh, and then the shepherd is sent him here and there. So, that would now... <laughs> We can interpret that claim however we like, but in the context of the funerary monument, that is a claim of identity of some kind. Hmm. Yes, allegiance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and a question back to you, Yash, is is the identity in verse three of being a disciple in accord or in some discord with him being a citizen in line one? Not necessarily. I mean, it's an unusual religious claim in antiquity, being a disciple of Holy Shepherd. But <laughs> well, Van Harne thought it was Addis, the son of Kubele, yeah. who is the uh, the shepherd. But the word that's bugging you is Matetes, is disciple, no, which is that. more philosophical, more schoolroom. But certainly within Christian texts, beginning with the Gospel of Mark, written around 70, becomes a term for a follower of Jesus. So, but is it a technical term? Or is it, I mean, it means student. I mean, it's, it's a garden variety Greek word. Well, it incites some kind of ritual action. If anyone who reads is supposed to pray, then that, that creates a scenario in which a ritual supposedly takes place on the earth. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And so what are they supposed to, what does it mean to pray for a bear case? If Rosengarten's right that he's talking to us as we walk by on our way to the market, what is he asking? Well, he seems to have some sort of ritual prescription involving two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Next. Mm-hmm. So there seems to be a, a specific right way that people who are reading this those who understand would know how it's done. Yeah. Is that a correct translation? Tomb? Is that a synonymous? Yes. Yeah? It's actually a, it's a concrete tomb boss. Tomb. And it means probably what it means now? And it's a really harmonic, musically harmonious or something? Um, I'm sorry. Name? About the tomb? Yeah, everyone the in tomb. tomb. What does that mean? Oh, oh anyone tomb. in tomb? No, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, I thought you were saying tomb. Um, because the tomb is also a question as to what's referred to, because at least according to the biographer, there's um, a base 
And then there is the bomos or the stele, the, 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 the set that, that goes on top. And then presumably the body is underneath both of them. But I heard you wrong. The word sonodos means one who sings along with the song. But is that also a coded term for a like-minded other? Just like the beginning of the phrase with uh, the one who understands these things. Are these really coordinated terms? I mean, it is umentoi is a it's, it is a it, it's it's it, it is um, an adversative here that's moving to another uh, another thought. Um, one possibility is that it's it's adversative to the immediately preceding verse nineteen. Um, another possibility is that the structure of this twenty-two verse thing is that it begins with a customary formula about citizenship in the first uh, uh, two lines, and then in verse three begins a Christian initiate kind of, <coughs> of material for the sonodos, for the, the, the one in tune, and then it comes back in verses 20 to 22 with pretty boilerplate, um, uh, not quite a, a curse, um, we often get curses against those who will defile the tomb, um, but this is actually a financial pecuniary threat um, that if anyone yanks my body out and puts another in. So two options, right, in terms of, of the structure. And remember what I said in terms of what do you see, that we actually don't know on how many faces of the stone this inscription was placed. Right? which means that some of these parts may have been on different faces of the stone. Um, Can I ask one question? Yes. Yeah. And a lot of what we've been discussing uh, comes in a text, which is what, so, uh, fourth century. So the, the, there's quite a space between the inscription we have and the bits of Yes, around. exactly. There, there might be a question of how much has been rewritten. Exactly. So one of the things here is you have a text and the text is, is misleadingly simple as presented here with almost no apparatus criticus. That is, I only gave you one variant reading because it's, 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 a, it's a pretty crucial one for the question that some have asked about if this is a Christian initiate who's proclaiming in some sense that affiliation of being a disciple of the Holy Shepherd, is it, some ask, crypto Christian, that is, he's doing it in a sotto voce and only our sonodoi will get it, or is it fanero Christian? In other words, is it really kind of out there in the city proclaiming that? So I'm just showing you this to, 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 to give you a, a minor glimpse of the deep complexity of reconstructing this text. Um, in fact, what we only have for um, uh, the Abercus inscription itself, as I said, is those middle lines from 7 through um, what, 16 or 15. Um, then the top is actually the first two verses, uh, and then the last two uh, are not extant on the stones that are in the Vatican, but they're actually taken from a different funerary monument that, that according to archaeologists, has copied the Abercus monument and reads the same text as does, the, or relatively the same text, as does the fourth century life of Abercus. But the life of Abercus itself is a text that exists both in manuscript traditions in a Russian translation in uh, where Berkius' uh, um, saint day in the Menologion is included. So we have Greek witnesses, we have also Russian witnesses to the life of Berkius itself. So these are inscription fragments for top and bottom and middle, and then you have manuscript traditions for what's, what's, uh, uh, what's in the center, uh, which means that what you are looking at that appears to be such a certain and fixed textual artifact is itself as much reconstructed as is those two lumps of stone sitting on the, uh, on, on, on the pedestal. 
Um, and that is, maybe I'll take this to be a, a moment then to turn to, to some of the things I think uh, one might do in introducing religion this way. So what's religion about? Is religion about people and death? Is religion about ritual? And what, after all, is ritual? And how does one know when a ritual is in view? In this text, we have water, fish, wine, bread. But when is that just what you live with? And when is it action that we would call ritual, or that they would call and be ritual action? As you've noted, we have prayer, um, perhaps, according to many interpreters, um, in line um, text. In line uh, nine, you have this lampras fragis, which is a resplendent seal. And sealing is one of the languages of baptism in early Christian texts. Probably as early as the first century, there are some allusions in the letters of Paul, but especially in the second century. And so is that also another ritual act that's denoted there? We also have texts, at least in two places in the inscriptions. Do you see that? Um, at least the way that I translated it, um, in line six, we have trustworthy texts. Grammar pisa. But what are those trustworthy texts? Right? Is this a canon? Is there a nascent group, etc.? And then we have someone named Paulus Paul, and we have other places in the second century where Paul denominates the corpus of letters of Paul in some version. So having Paul in the car with him could mean he had a book of the Pauline letters, a uh, codex or a scroll. So uh, is religion about people, death, ritual, text? Is it about who? About travel? Um, there's a whole travelogue, um, very extensive, between Rome and then Nisibis and Euphrates, um, and then he is from Heropolis in central Phrygia, in central uh, Turkey. Um, so what does the travel mean? Um, the Vatican inscription thinks the travel means that Christianity was a unified thing. And so Bergius' travel means the Christianism that he represents is everywhere in the points on which he goes, and therefore that he affirms its unity. Um, that is, in my view, a, 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 a mythic fiction, um, uh, certainly for the second century. But, but travel, what does travel do in terms of creating networks that we might call religious? Who are the companions? Um, is religion about esotericism? Some people get things and others don't. What about politics and citizenship? He mentions that he, he mentions Heropolis, where he is um, a, where he is a citizen. Um, in my own reading of the inscription, I think that he is affirming very boldly his citizenship. He's not renouncing citizenship uh, in favor of some Christianism as an alternative. I mean, he actually wants both the city government of Heropolis and those who pray to keep a guard over his body, including the inscription that he's offered. But are they compatible? So we have a city Heropolis, a city Rome, others. We have a queen. We have a Laos, a people. Is that the Populus Romanus that he saw? Is it the people of Rome? And of course, the people of Rome is itself a, a political construct um, that's powerful around the Mediterranean um, in the second century. Is religion public or is it private? And can it ever be fully one or the other? Is this inscription about a public attestation or a private one or some merger? Um, symbols. Is religion about a symbol set? Look at some here that you've named. Shepherd, queen, people, fish, virgin. Um, and isn't it the nature or is it the nature of symbols that they can be read on more than one level and that they're multivalent? Um, so what does that mean for how we understand religion if part of what this, uh, this uh, uh, complex physical object uh, is, is uh, a, symbol, um, a symbol catalog? And then about identity. Abertius wants you to encounter him as he sits under this monument at the south gate of the city of Theropolis. Um, what is identity and how does it relate to religion? Can one be religious? 
Does one declare religion? Does one do religion? How does this inscription um, and its full physical uh, monumental context uh, identify or name what the relationship is between religion and identity? And then gods. Do you need gods to have a religion? And is there a god in this text? The word Deos isn't in there. The word Jesus isn't in there. Um, who are the gods and where are the gods? Those are some questions. So why do I choose this? Goals. First, to show the complexity of this textual object and also how it may construct religion or we may construct religion through it. Secondly, I, I really want students to see and uh, that evidences for religion come to us already profoundly shaped by circles of interpretation. That is, we don't have unmediated access to most of the evidences for religion. So in introducing students to any source, we also need to introduce them to those circles of interpretation that have brought that source to our attention. Um, so in this case, we have Abertius interprets himself. Secondly, the physical ornamentation, the wreath, and perhaps other things, are also part of the circle of interpretation. When is a wreath just a garland? And when is a wreath the crown of salvation, as attested in the earliest Christian text, uh, First Thessalonians by Paul. Um, when is a bonos, an altar, just a physical object that you can buy at Ace Hardware? And when is an altar a specialized religious object um, with perhaps invitations on the top for libations and for, uh, for, for, uh, for um, uh, sacrifice, etc.? So what is this, this object? That's part of its interpretive force. Um, Thirdly, we have this life in the late 4th century that I've only been able to refer to very briefly. But the life of Abericus basically says that Abericus was a bishop in Hierapolis. He tried to decimate, or actually he did, decimated the temple of Apollo, and the demons got mad, and they said, Abericus, we're going to make you go to Rome, even though you don't want to. And then what the demon did is it got up and it went to Rome, and it infiltrated Lucilla, the daughter of the emperor Marcus Aurelius. And the demon inside Lucila, as she was demon-possessed, said, I won't come out till you bring Abercius from Hierapolis in, uh, in Asia. So Abercius was brought to Rome. I have some cool pictures so you can sort of imagine this. So Abercius was brought all the way from Turkey to Rome by imperial cohort, um, according to this legend. And they brought him to the, to the Palatine, uh, or possibly to the Circus Maximus, where there was a contest of demons. And Abercius, performing words from Jesus in Mark 5 and other places, said to the demon, come out, come out. And the demon said, I will only come out. Or and the demon said, send me into the Bomos that is here on the Spina, in the middle of the Palatine um, uh, 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 um, uh, Hippodrome. And so Abertius expels the demon, the demon goes into the Bomos, the demon takes a consolation lap around the Palatine, <laughs> uh, in the Bomos, and then go, travels to Turkey, um, thousands of miles east and sets it up at the south gate of the city, where it's waiting for Bertius when he returns from his travels, and then ultimately has a nice death, and he is the last piece of the funerary moment. His body is put inside. So, um, so this is obviously a rather shaping force of uh, the Vita, and it's not only the source from which we have the full inscription in some form, but it's also, in my view, trying to Christianize what is clearly not a Christian-looking object from the point of view of the fourth century uh, uh, author. So then, fast forward, when these things are discovered, we have a big debate between Berlin and Rome where the Protestants want to claim that it's not Catholic, and it certainly doesn't show a single unified Catholic church, and it's not even Christian, and then the, the Vatican archaeologists want to show that it is absolutely Christian, and it is uber-Christian, because it is showing the unity of the Catholic church already in the late second century. Then we have the Vatican Museum, with which we began, which is where one most often encounters the Abertius inscription, in the force field that is created by putting this billboarded object, this reconstruction, next to the real, real stones. Okay. So, um, third, 
Um, many interesting artifacts, textual and otherwise, are both multimedia. And I think that when students are introduced to religion, they need to think about media very, very early on, and along with that, multivalence. Fourthly, context, 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 context matters. Um, and so one of the issues for that, then, is how then to start filling in context as students ask questions like, is it usual for a text box to be um, to begin in verse seven or, or this kind of thing, right? Um, fifth, to study religion is to study, in my judgment, acts of self-positioning that often include within them comparison, if not overt polemics, with religious alternatives, while at the same time also negotiating tensions with them. So sometimes combining symbols that might be uh, symbols that are claimed by others and, and, and assimilating them and sometimes offering resistance to them. And again, I think the American inscription allows us to see that live in a nice way. And I do think that life and death, presence and absence, fixity and dissolution are a big part of this whole Averkius multimedia thing. All right, um, pedagogical thoughts. Um, how best to follow up with this? If I led with this in an intro to religion class, what do, what do you do next? Um, one is you engage in further historical contextualization, which is how I do it in my class. And uh, Ina printed a handout for you if you're interested, just in case you have some of your questions to uh, follow through uh, on. Um, set another is to enlarge the field of evidence. That is, give them a lot of different translations uh, to compare, give them different images. A third is comparative. <coughs> That is, you bring in the cult of Kubele, the Magna Mater, um, and Attis, and her famous stone that traveled to Rome. You bring in other real cults, uh, such as the Mithraic cult, etc. You bring in other funerary inscriptions. A fourth is you pick out a motif, the fish, the shepherd, the resplendent seal, or another, and you get students working on what might that uh, mean. My concerns, I, I think, illustrated the problem, <laughs> as so often. It's a very, number one, it's a very complex case, right? It begins simple. It's only 22 lines. It's only on one page. Hey, I could read that. Some of you looked at your packet at midnight. You're like, oh, good. It's a short one, right? <laughs> um, but it's a very complex case. So um, secondly, a problem is that the instructor can become the shell answer person. That is, she's the one who knows the complexities of the object, and the students are then asking, am I right? Um, that can be a problem in learning, right? Because then they just assume somebody else has got the answer, and they just need to tap it. So how to ensure their confidence, um, that's both a substance and a style issue in uh, teaching, I think. Thirdly, um, to begin with this might be, um, again, to even in contesting Christianism, um, could still, in some sense, normalize Christianism as the, the, the lens into which we begin to study religion. Because when we started listing the things that are religion, we really went for kind of, cre certainly cult and code, right? We kind of went for the sort of the three C's which are associated with Christianity or Christianity's most in, in, the, in, the, in the ancient language, in the, in the Greek language. So there are issues that I have uh, um, various and somewhat ambivalent thoughts about in using this example. Um, but uh, you were pretty good as a class. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, any thoughts? I mean, one of, the thing, one of the thoughts that I have just as somebody's taught an introduction to religious studies, and I think this would be a, a great way to begin an introduction to religious studies. But for me, using it, I don't have the context. And how, you know, and I think that that's the big challenge of this class is how do we do this when we personally don't have the context? It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful example. I think that's what scares me. <laughs> 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 You said we were we were a great class. What sorts of answers do you get? What what kind of range of answers do you get? Were they largely the ones that we gave? I mean, we were talking about pretty fine grained elements of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that it becomes exegetical very fast, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing, right? I mean, that, that you want people to say, 
you know, that, that they're, they're taking seriously what's in front of them, whether it's the visual or, or the, um, uh, the, the textual. The difficulty is going to the next level. And so then, um, in, 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 in a, you know, more than the time that we had as well. I mean, I think you would spend at least a whole class just on their perceptions mm -hmm. and just also trying to destabilize the what is this text and text and image and you know that in itself is an hour or more of conversation. Um, then I think some clusters of individual observations to then lift it to a higher level of generalization of you know can we bucket some of these different observations. Um, and I, I, I found when I teach it in the ancient colloquium that largely that can happen. Um, but I mean, I guess one question in that regard is, are we talking about introduction for first-year undergraduates or graduate yeah. students? Yeah. Yeah. Because, um, yeah. because also wrapped up here are huge issues of uh, not Christianity, but claims on Christianity and the Catholic right. and Protestant and so right. on, right. Um, which, which become rapidly very complicated. They do. So the, I suppose the, the, the inspiration of those questions, but where do we, where do we pillar the introduction? For whom? Yeah, and, and that has to do with a lot of things, including what Lucy said, though, and this is sort of one of my answers to what Lucy said about students are all, you know, the reason I concluded with, you know, these are acts of self-positioning, is that what you're also trying to get is the students to see where they are self-positioned, right? And, and so by making it about the history of reception and interpretation of the object, you're putting them within, um, you know, but they're, they're now part of that history of interpretation in some sense. Hey, do you have any sort of programmatic agenda that leads out of this exercise? So for the class as a whole, let's imagine you were teaching it to as an intro for undergrads. Would that then would you be explicit about what that is? If you had it, would you say, oh, this this is what you these are some things you said, this leads us to, or would you know, how would that work if you're trying to shape the course around an exercise? Yeah, I I think I, I basically laid out um, what for me are, are the chief programmatic, uh, what, what is the chief programmatic agenda, which is um, putting the evidence, putting the, 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 the primary sources in the middle and allowing for some immediate encounter and dignifying that immediate encounter um, while at the same time helping students to both generate and then follow up on questions that the evidence, that, that their interaction with the evidence uh, occasions, right? So I think that's crucial. But at the same time, you can't um, provide them an innocent um, credulity vis-a-vis -vis the status of it as evidence. But how to do that in the best way that they don't feel the floor's been pulled out from them. In, in other words, you know, that, that you're giving them something and saying, deal with this, what is this? And this is this is a something. I mean, people interpret this um, in the world. But then getting them to be part of the history of interpretation, thinking about uh, about what it, what it means. Um, also, I think I really do, as I mean, Lucy alluded to this, is that um, especially for us as, as scholars of religion, that students come in with assumptions that religion is a separable item and that it's got a predictable cast of characters and they do certain things and we know what those are. So, I mean, I think when you said it's got money in it, um, you know, of course religion has money in it um, in a major way. And so, so part of my agenda, if you will, is to enlarge the sphere of what counts or might count as religion. Does that, do you have a specific question about like, am I really like in my, you're talking about how, 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 how much you're concealing or revealing that programmatic. That's, yeah, that's part of the question. So is it, you know, do you, at the end of the class, and this is, I think, also maybe just a style thing, but um, at the end of the class, do you say, so here are some sort of ways that we, you know, so are you explicit about saying, I'm really interested in your ability to, to craft the skill of analyzing and being critical of evidence. Oh, yeah. Thus, you know, yeah. this is what we'll do in this class. Yeah. Um, or is yeah. it more that you're sort of slowly trying to shape them because you could be explicit about saying a huge part of studying religion is the ability to be skeptical of evidence mm -hmm. to yourself. I think both, and that's also, though, I think partly evident in my kind of half turn today from the way I teach with this 
in a graduate setting to how I would teach with it in an undergraduate setting. And of course, I haven't done that, so I don't fully know like, like how, that, how, how that works. What I do in, in the ancient colloquium is I have a very clear uh, 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 set agenda for the ancient colloquium, which is that um, there are these narratives of the so-called rise of Christianity, which are, uh, I, 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 I adopt Hayden White's typology of different types of narratives, and I structure the course around the question, can a narrative of the so-called rise of Christianity not be either a romance or a tragedy? Um, and, and how might one construct, or can one construct a narrative at all? And then what I try to, to do is I begin with this great statue of, of uh, Constantine um, in the Capitoline Museum, which has got this huge kneecap, you know, in the head, and I say it's about fragments. And so the work is, historiographic work, is shaping fragments into some kinds of narrative. So what I try to do throughout the class is fragment, narrative, and, but not just like, give it a narrative, but what narratives is it already involved in, and then how might we re-narrativize or really un-narrativize that piece of evidence. So that's my, my agenda. And then what I also try to do in the, in the grad class is I model with the handout that, that is in the back or wherever it is, um, the historical contextualization exercise that I want every student in the class to do, um, because they will each pick a fragment and be responsible for um, articulating uh, that fragment. And it involves some very clear steps about its history of discovery, about the manuscripts, about the textual editions, if it's a textual artifact, um, uh, key issues in its interpretation. Um, I think I could probably modify that assignment for undergraduates, but as presently configured, I think it is, uh, um, well, I've had a few undergrads in that class, but as presently configured, it's, I think, um, it's doing too much for an introduction to the class. We have a 15 minute break. Um, oh. Get some more food, get some more coffee, please sign in if you haven't signed in, and we reconvene at 1015 with Wendy Donker. Thanks to Dean Mitchell. <laughs>